Good morning. You can be turning your Bibles to Romans chapter 14. That's where we're going to spend our time this morning. We'll get to that passage here in just a moment, not too far away from where you were in John 17. But it's good to see you this morning. We've got a good crowd of folks with us this morning. We do have some visitors with us, and we want to welcome you. I'm joined in with Tim and the others who have welcomed you already. And to let you know, we're excited to have you with us this morning on this beautiful day. Beautiful outside because of the weather, but beautiful here because it is the Lord's Day, and we have a good opportunity to be here together and to worship Him. And what a beautiful, beautiful thing it is for God's people to be together and worship Him in the way that we've done. And I certainly have been encouraged and uplifted by our worship today, and I know you have as well, and I'm excited about our opportunity to open up God's Word and to study from it. We think about the reality of Scripture, really from the beginning to the really to the very end one thing that you can find out is almost through all time disunity and division has always been an issue for God's people it's always been there it's always been an issue it's always been something that God has had to deal with that God has had to talk about really from the earliest till all the way through the pages of the New Testament even in his own nation the people of Israel We have a united part that we talk about and a divided part that we talk about. So even in that general sense that you see over and over and over, and even in the pages of the Old Testament, you all the time see civil wars and family fights being talked about, God's people struggling to be united. And even in the pages of the New Testament, Almost every local church mentioned in the New Testament had some sort of division to contend with. Whether it was the Apostle Paul or another New Testament writer had to include in a letter written to them or written about them an admonition to be united, to work together, to not be divided, to be with one another, to be one. And just as we read from John 17 as Jesus towards the very end of his life he prays to the father and and ends that prayer and thinking about all the ones that would come later like us he prays that we be one that we be unified that we be together even in this context of the book of Romans not far away where you have a picture given to us by the apostle Paul that we've talked about recently In Romans chapter 12, the illustration of the Lord's church as a physical body. The importance of being united and being one body. And so throughout Scripture, you continually see this. Even in the book of Psalms, where the psalmist will say in Psalm 133 and verse 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity and I certainly amen that and I want us to keep that picture a passage like this in Psalm 133 and verse 1 the importance of being one the importance of being united the importance of not allowing division and disunity to creep in among us I want us to keep those thoughts at the very front of our mind because as we study A passage like this in Romans chapter 14, I want us to understand that this chapter is all about that. It is all about the importance of unity. It's all about the importance of not being divided, not being disunified, but being unified. Sometimes we open a passage up like this in Romans chapter 14, and before we even read verse 1, I know there are several here in the audience that have already put into their mind well this is a hard chapter this is tough stuff this is difficult to grasp this is hard to grab hold of and I want us to think about before we even get into the chapter itself how defeated that is in any aspect of our life how well do we operate in life before we do any task we convince ourselves that that task is going to be too difficult for me to do how well is that going to work out for me if I convince myself ahead of time that's just too hard that's too tough that's too difficult well that means we're going to have a very difficult time sometimes I think we do that with scripture 
Yes, there can be scriptures that on the very surface, it is exactly what God wants, and other scriptures where it may take some effort for us to see what God is wanting us to see. But I want us to understand, each and every spot that we open up God's word, it is him declaring to us what he wants us to know, and the key component to that is he wants us to know it. God's word is not a puzzle box. God's word is not an escape room where you have to uncipher and or decipher all of the code in order to really unlock what he wants for us to understand. Sometimes these more difficult passages like this in Romans 14 may not be as difficult as what we convince ourselves that they are. And I want us this morning to see that I believe this chapter is one of those examples. I've heard, and as you probably have heard for a long, long time, how challenging Romans 14 is. We're going to go through it this morning, and I want you to do so with the thought that I had you to put in the very front of your minds, that Romans 14 is not a passage that talks about Christians getting to do whatever they want to do. That Romans 14 is a passage about unity. That Romans 14 is a passage that pushes away division and disunity among God's people. And now keeping that in the front of your minds, I believe a study of Romans 14 can be helpful to us. And really helpful even during the time that we're dealing with today. As we think about this letter specifically and the passage that we're going to look at here in the book of Romans, specifically chapter 14. It's a letter written to the brethren there in Rome. And as we get to this chapter, what we find is you have brethren who are struggling, who are struggling in every way, who are divided, and they're divided over something very specific. What we have in Romans 14 is you have a very specific example of something that the brethren there were struggling with, specifically something they were divided over. They were divided over special diets. They were divided over special days. Some among the brethren there in Rome thought it was a sin specifically to eat meat. And some thought it was a sin not to observe the Jewish holy days. There was criticism. There was judgment. You had each group on both sides, each group on both sides thinking that the other side wasn't as spiritual as they were. And today we can have similar problems. Similar problems with things that may not be clearly defined as right or wrong in God's Word. As we open up God's Word, there are some things that are clearly designated as wrong things because the Bible specifically condemns them. Other things that we know are right because the Bible clearly commands them, but other things, not as clearly defined in Scripture, We find ourselves in need of guidance, and Paul provides those principles here in Romans chapter 14. Now, as we study through this chapter, I want us to keep in mind what we're going to see is a very specific example for them at the time. But there are two principles, I think, that we have, two principles that after we establish those principles by going through this chapter, we'll be able at the end of the lesson close with some examples that can come into play for us today as we study an example that was very specific for them. And so as we go through this chapter, and that's what we're going to do, we're going to go through every verse of this chapter. We're going to do it in sections. We're not going to tear apart every single verse, but I do want us to see that as Paul lays it out for us, there are two overlaying principles that certainly he wanted those brethren in Rome to grab hold of that will help them with their situation and he wants us to grab hold of that can help us in our situations today. And the first one is receive, receive one another. You know, it's interesting, the very context that we have here in Romans 15 that that I believe also kind of plays over into Romans 15 a little bit begins and ends with this same principle. 
You have it at the very outset. Romans 14 and verse 1, receive one who is weak in the flame the very outset. You can turn a page, at least in my Bible. Maybe it's on the same opening for you, but in Romans chapter 15, now in verse 7, towards the very end of this context, even though we're not going to dive into chapter 15 this morning, but kind of as this thought progresses, he says in Romans 15 and verse 7, therefore receive one another, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God receive one another. If you look that word up in the Greek and you just look at the definition of it, what you're going to see and and have an understanding that this is a word that just simply means to welcome. To welcome. And I want us to understand this is a huge principle here. A huge principle because the issue was that on both sides for the brethren there, whether you were on the side of you can eat meat or on the, uh, uh, the side is you, you, you can't eat meat or you're on the side of you've got to keep these holy days or you're on the side of you don't have to keep these old holy days. The point that's being made in this chapter is the issue is on both sides wrong things were happening. What you're going to find in Romans 14 is not you've got to go this way because this side is the right way. Sometimes we like to think that's what Romans 14 is teaching us, how to determine which side is right. But that's not what this chapter is doing at all. This chapter is helping us to understand that there are things that is foolish for us to be divided over. And for the brethren here in Rome, one of those things or two of those things really is being discussed here. And so the point is both are doing wrong things. You had on one side, you had either they were looking down and despising one another, or on the other side, they were judging or condemning one another. And so he begins this discussion, receive each other, welcome each other. So why should we do that? Well, as God often does in his word, he answers those questions for us. That's the question that pops up in our mind. Why? Why then should we do that? Why should I receive one another? Why should I welcome one another? And what God so much does for us in his wisdom and his love, he answers that question. And that is the beginning portion of this chapter. He says, receive one another. So why do that? He answers that for us. And so he begins with this idea. We should receive one another because God has received. Read the text with me. Romans 14, verse 1 through 3. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. You know, the point that's being made right off the bat is he says, listen, this side over here, you've got things you're doing wrong. But guess what? He says, this side over here, you've got things that you're doing wrong. You're arguing, you're disputing over these doubtful things. But he wants them to understand, you've got to receive or welcome each other. Why? Because God has done that. God has received him, he says at the end of verse 3. Over these doubtful issues that Paul uses phrase-wise, they're drawing lines of fellowship. They are judging one another. And we're reminded here, and the brethren are reminded, only the Lord can decide those things. He has told us what those things are in Scripture. So because God has received us, we must receive one another. We must receive one another. We cannot find ourselves arguing over those things. Secondly, he says, Christ, Christ is Lord. And why is that important? Look at what he says. Verse 5, one person esteems one day above another. That's the specific example that we're talking about for them. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. 
And he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord. For he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. I'll give you a free Bible study tip. When you read a small passage like the one we've just read, verses 5 through 9, and you see a word that is repeated a bunch of times, take note because that's an important word. And in just these five verses, how many times do we see the word Lord? Over and over and over, so many times it almost becomes difficult to read, right? Now, you ever run across a passage where the same word is there so many times it becomes difficult to read out loud? That's this passage. The point is being made that Jesus, he is the Lord. And so the point that he makes in this passage, for them specifically, the one who treats a special day as holy, he does so to the Lord. And the one who treats every day as sacred does so to the Lord. He who eats meat gives thanks to the Lord. And the one who abstains, abstains to the Lord. Our first priority in all of these issues is not to self. That's when we find ourselves disputing and dividing and arguing. Our first priority is always to the Lord. When self is involved, there's going to be a problem. And there's going to be a problem, listen, every time. Not some of the time, not most of the time, not a few of the times, every time. Every time when self is above the Lord in thought or in action, There will be problems. How many times? Every time. Every time there is division. Every time there is arguments over silly things. Every time there is disunity in the Lord's church. Every time this happens, the Lord certainly isn't being considered. Never, ever was there, I'm going to argue with a brother or sister over something ridiculous. I'm going to divide from them. I'm going to condemn them. I'm going to despise them. I'm going to look down upon them. I'm going to laugh at them. I'm going to point my finger at them over this silly thing because that's what the Lord wants me to do. Never has a statement been uttered like that. Because God wants his people to be unified. He's desperate for it. He's prayed about it. He's written about it. He wants his people to be unified. And we can be if our focus is on Christ the Lord. I'll tell you one other thing that will help that is our focus on Christ as the judge. Look at what he says at the end of this first text. Verse 10, but why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then let each of us, or each of us shall give account to, of himself to God. Now, oftentimes we take these few verses way away from Romans chapter 14. And I think there are some points to be made in general about judgment, in general about the fact that we we will all stand before God. Absolutely. We will all bow before him on judgment. Every single one of us will have to give an account of what we do. I think those general principles are in play for sure. But this morning, let's not do that. Let's not take it out of Romans 14. We're studying that passage. He's talking to these brethren who are disputing and condemning and judging over these senseless ideas and things and he reminds them listen Jesus he is the judge why why are you judging why are you despising 
There's one judge, and one day you will stand before him. Maybe the point that's made here is you will bow before him. So why are you judging? Why are you despising? There is one judge. And so the point here in principle number one that's made in Romans chapter 14 is we've got to welcome each other. We've got to receive each other. We're not interested in despising. We're not interested in looking down upon. We're not interested in condemning. We're not interested in doing any of those other things. We are only interested in receiving one another. But as this chapter goes on, if we stop just with this first admonition, it it, it may seem that the way that Christians should go about our relationship with one another is just that we should just leave each other alone. It it may seem that if, if it's just this first admonition, that it should be, well, well just, I'll, I'll, just leave, I'll just leave everybody alone. I, I'll just leave all the brethren, I'll just leave everybody alone. I'll just completely pull away in every capacity. But this chapter continues by giving us principle number two. And principle number two is this, we've got to edify one another. We've got to edify one another. Instead of the thought of just walking away and stepping away and not having anything to do with anybody, we are reminded about the importance to love one another. And if we love one another, we will seek to edify and to build each other up. So how does he remind us of that? How does we show that? Well, he does it in a couple of interesting ways. He wants us to remind, he wants to remind us what effect we have on each other. And he does so by beginning with the idea that we do have an effect on each other. And it is a reality I've got to have in my mind. What I say and what I do affects the brethren that I'm around. It has an impact. Now, that impact can be positive or that impact can be negative, but it has an impact. What you say and what you do has an impact on the people that sit around you, how you interact with them. Now, that can be positive or that can be negative, but there is an impact. Look at what he says beginning of verse 13 of Romans chapter 14. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a a cause to fall in our brother's way. I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet, if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one whom Christ died. Now, I made the point just a moment ago that we have an impact on one another. We have an effect on each other. And that can be positive or that can be negative, but we have an effect on each other. In this passage, note the ways that are mentioned. They're not good here. They're not good because they're not acting the way that they need to act. And because they're not acting the way that they need to act, listen, they're having an effect on each other because that's what happens. Brethren affect one another. That's not something we could turn off. We affect one another, and it can be good or it can be bad depending upon how I'm doing, what I'm doing. Now, these brethren here in Rome were not doing the right thing. They've already had that talk to about. Because of that, they're having an effect, but it's not a good one. Look at what's mentioned. They could cause others to stumble. That's not good. They can grieve one another. It doesn't sound too good. Paul will even use the phrase, destroy each other. You mean even over these silly little things? These silly little things that Paul has already painted the picture that it doesn't make a difference on either side. Both are doing it to the Lord. Even in that, we can destroy one another. Maybe what will help us is thinking that the issue at hand isn't so much how does this affect me? but maybe how does it affect my brother? 
Well, maybe a different answer is, if I do this thing, how does it affect my brother? You see, that, that's how love operates. Remember, that, that's now taking self out of the picture. It's not about how does this affect me, but how does it affect my brother? Because Christians affect each other. Secondly, Christians are to have the right priorities. To me, this is the most important piece of Romans chapter 14. To remind us of what our priorities are. In verse 16, he says, Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil, for the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit for he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Why is this such an important passage? Well, I want you to think about how many times you've seen churches divide or at least have big problems over matters that were insignificant things. Just insignificant things. But the fights and the battles and the arguments over those things because self is in the way divides the people of God. It is the phrase that we'll often use instead of focusing on the externals, focus on the eternals, if you've heard that phrase before. That's what this passage is right here. Verse 17, the kingdom of God is not food and drink. It's not the kingdom of God, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. We're not to focus on those external things, but focus on the eternal things like righteousness and peace and joy and love. You focus on those things, there won't be division in these matters. But our priorities have to be right. We've got to be there for each other. We've got to be there to help each other grow. Verse 19, I'll tell you in my Bible, I have it highlighted in yellow. I don't know when I did that. It wasn't this week, but it's been highlighted in yellow. Verse 19, therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is neither good, it is good neither to eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles, or is offended, or is made weak. The point that he's making here is we're, we're here to help each other grow. And I think one of the points that he makes in Romans 14, it would be good for us to start, certainly start to consider in the examples that we'll use here in just a moment, is that the point that he's making is, listen, both sides are in need of growth. Both sides are in need of growth. Everybody here. There's not a side that's right or wrong. Both sides are doing the wrong thing in Romans chapter 14. That's why we have this chapter. And he says both sides are in need of growth. Both sides need each other. Both sides need to have the proper opinions or, or, or priorities, excuse me. And so as he closes this chapter, he reminds us, that listen, we're not here to force the opinions, even convicted ones, on others. He closes the chapter with this in verse 22. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. Now, I, I want us real quick as we bring this section kind of to a close. Is, as I use the New King James Version, I, I, I want you to understand the use of the word faith. Oftentimes, we'll see references to the faith, it's the doctrine of Christ, the gospel. Or just faith that it's something that I believe in, that I'm convicted about. And that's what's being talked about here in Romans 14. What's being talked about are things that I have conviction about. 
Romans 14 is not a hodgepodge to toss every thought or idea that I have into this chapter. It's not a place for, listen, I think the best color in the world is red. I think that's the case, and, and that's just the way it's going to be. And you you got you to gotta be okay with that because Romans 14. No, no, no. That's not what's being talked about here. We're, talked about, we're talking about things that people are convicted about convicted they believe in these things the ones who were not eating meat were not doing so because they were convicted about that they were convicted about that because they had been brought up as a jew for the entirety of their life and for generations back peter himself struggled with this you remember in acts chapter 10 in Acts chapter 10, the Peter is going to the home of Cornelius there in Acts chapter 10, and, and God shows before him the sheet with all of the animals, and he says, kill and eat. And Peter there says, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I, I've not eaten any of those things ever. I'm not going to do it now. The Apostle Paul in the book of Acts saw it important to continue to keep the holy day. They were convicted about that. And there were Jews here at the church in Rome that had those same convictions. And you had others who were convicted that you didn't need to keep those things, that now we're free in Christ and we have liberty to, to eat what we want to eat and to make sure every day is sacred unto the Lord. And Paul is making them understand that those things are insignificant things. If you're convicted about one of those things, you, you keep that conviction. But he says, verse 22, do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. You fall into a big-time trap, a big-time trap, when we begin trying to place those upon other people. God has given us everything from what we need to do and what we need to steer clear of And so when we look at a chapter like this in Romans chapter 14, two thoughts, and I'm going to give you a close with a couple of examples. When we think about this chapter in and of itself, never, ever, ever can a sinful thing be placed in this chapter and said that I have the liberty to do what I want to do. We cannot use Romans 14 in any way to say, listen, I, I believe, I am convicted that fornication is okay, and you cannot tell me otherwise. Romans 14 is in no way talking about things that are sinful, that are wrong, that God has given to us. But also not every thought and opinion that I have is being talked about here either, those things that I'm convicted about. So we begin to think about it in those kinds of ways, it may come into play much less than we think. Here in Romans chapter 14, it was an issue that they were having. Now, an issue that they were having specific for them. Is this an issue that we're probably going to run across today? Probably not, but it's not out of the stretch of imagination that this exact same scenario can come into play today. Maybe you have someone straight out of Judaism converted to Christ. And they find themselves in this exact same place on what they are convicted about to eat or the days that they are to keep sacred. Or someone out of the Islam religion who also have thoughts specifically on what to eat and what not to eat. And so this exact same scenario could come into play, but probably won't. So I want to give you just a couple of things to think about where this can come into play. And then we'll close this morning. Let, let's start with a couple of things that are front and center from where we all are today. And we'll start with the thing that most of us are covered up with, the mask on our faces. Not right now, but before before the governor put a mandate on that we, when indoors, wear masks, 
before that happened. And, and the reason I say before that happened, if you were with us last week and we studied from Romans chapter 13, if not, I, I would encourage you to maybe take a listen to that lesson. But the point is made in Romans chapter 13 that as a Christian, we are obligated, if possible, to follow the government and to follow God. If we can do both of those things, we're obligated to do both of those things. That is clear. And if we choose not to do that, for whatever reason, we think it's dumb, or we think it's stupid, or we think it's silly, or whatever the case, I'm not going to follow the government. Romans chapter 13 shows us that is a sinful attitude to do that. And so I'm not going to talk about that now. We as Christians are obligated because of what the government has said to put a mask on our face when we're indoors, whatever we think about it. But let's talk about before that happened, before that happened, before there was that mandate, and we were surrounded by people who were convicted by having a mask on their face and others who were convicted by that's the dumbest thing of all time. And they weren't going to put one on. You had convictions, heavy convictions on both sides, and you can easily see how when those convictions about something insignificant, when in discussion could be divisive, when on one side you have easily some who can look down upon or who can judge or who can despise or who can poke fun at. Now I pray none of that was going on here. But we can see how that can. And how much that could be a problem over something insignificant, but yet convicted about. Another example that we can see in our world playing out right now, never in my lifetime, never in my lifetime have I come across so many people convicted about their politics. Not just have thoughts about, not just, you know, I usually vote this way or vote that way. Not just that. I'm talking about convictions about politics. Never in my lifetime has it been to the amount of people that it is now. And we get caught up in those convictions and those thoughts. And how easy it is to despise or condemn to look down upon, to poke fun at, to single out, all divisive, over listen, insignificant things. It is not a sinful thing to push the button for a Republican. It is not a sinful thing to push the button for a Democrat. And if we find ourselves divided over those insignificant convictions, Romans 14 should get us to think about where our priorities are and to make sure that I'm not getting pulled in to the divisive and the disunity that comes from those kinds of things. Maybe it would be good to take on verse 22 of chapter 14 more often. Do you have faith? Do you have convic conviction? Have it to yourself before God. Personal convictions can come into play. Those are broad, very generalized convictions and things that are playing out in our lifetime. I'll give you just one other example. Um, it's one I don't want to give, but, but I will because I think it'll help. I don't want to give it because it's a personal conviction, and I don't want it to be misunderstood in any way. But I think it's also good to share this example because all of us, all of us have personal convictions about things. But yet, I'm trying my best to, you know, keep hold of verse 22. If I have a conviction about something, have it to yourself before God. And it's hard to do that as I'm going to share it in a room full of 310 people. But I hope you understand, and I hope this helps to see how this can come into play. So for me, a personal conviction that I have, a personal conviction, is specifically regards to dress on the Lord's Day. I have specific convictions about that, specific convictions. About the importance that when I'm up here speaking to have a coat and tie on, I'm convicted about that. I'm convicted about 
the fact that I need, I need to have my best on. I'm convicted about not putting a pair of blue jeans on as I come to worship. Those are feelings that I have, strong feelings that I have that my father instilled upon me and that I have instilled upon my children. But yet they're insignificant things. Not to bind or to lay down on anyone else. I could stand up here and condemn or despise or look down upon people who don't have those convictions. And you can sit there and think how old and how fuddy-duddy and how legalistic that guy is for having those convictions. But those are the kinds of things that Paul is talking here in Romans 14 to steer clear of. Those are insignificant things. But there's still convictions and, and, and things that I hold myself to. And it would be wrong to go against those convictions that I have personally. And I'm sure there's personal convictions that you have. I would encourage you to look closely again at Romans chapter 14 and verse 22 and have them to yourself before God. And that does not mean you cannot have a conversation <laughs> with other folks where these kinds of things come up, but what it does mean, that I'm not crawling upon my high horse, and I'm not lording it down on other folks, because when that happens, it is divisive. It's not about me, it's about the Lord. Each and every time. Verse 8, For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord. What a powerful passage that is. Well, I appreciate you listening so well this morning. Maybe you have other questions about this, about this chapter, about some of the things we've talked about this morning. I would welcome those questions, those thoughts. I feel confident speaking for our shepherds here to say that they would be wide open to a discussion on these kinds of topics and others. Wide open for that gives us some things to think about and I appreciate you thinking along with me this morning I know this lesson has been a little longer than usual I promise you this evening's sermon I'll give you all that time back I promise you that but it's important for us to think about these kinds of things and not just during the time that but we have but but all the time when these things have passed and they will can continue to think about this passage and the importance of unity in the Lord's church. That's what Romans 14 is all about, unity in the Lord's church. Well, Marcus is going to lead us in a song of imitation. It will give us an opportunity to think about where we stand with God. What a great opportunity it is to take a moment to make sure that we are standing with God. We saw right here in the book of Romans in chapter 14, reminding us that there is a time coming where each and every one of us will be bowed before him and giving account of all that we do. Let's make sure our life and our relationship with him is where it needs to be when that time comes, and that time could come at any moment. So that makes this opportunity such a good one. Let's take advantage of it. And if we can help you in any way, let us know as we stand and sing.